And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. Now recall that Joseph's been, uh, uh, he's been pulled out of the pit, and he's been sold off as a slave. So Reuben expected that Joseph would be in the pit so that he can get him out. That was his original plan, if you recall, in the previous verses that we covered. However, the verse says Joseph returned, he went back to the pit, and lo and behold, what do you know? Joseph was not there, so he rent his clothes. Usually when a, the Semites during this time, or the Jews, something sorrowful, something grievous happens, they'll always tear their clothes. Verse 30, and he, and he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? Meaning, he returned to his brothers, and then he said, The child, Joseph, is not there, and I, where can I go? What can I do about it? The reason why he's saying that is because of their father. So Reuben is worried, and he's saying, What am I going to do about it? I mean, I slept with my dad's wife, and, you know, now I, uh, we got rid of our little brother. My dad's really going to hate me. I want him to bless me before he dies. And obviously, he got a not really a blessing after that, if we know Reuben's story. Yeah. Verse 31, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. So, remember, they took Joseph's coat off of him. They took it, and then they killed a baby goat. That's what a kid of the goats is. They killed a baby goat, and then they dipped that coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. All right, remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word in the verse. That way you can understand each and every word in the verse. And people don't uh, develop excuses. Well, the Bible's too hard to understand. I can't understand each and every word. No, that's not true. As when you keep coming to church, reading the Bible yourself, going to Bible study classes, it, the natural just comes to you. It does come. It's not that hard to read, uh, hard to understand. <coughs> so hear me, all right, as I explain everything. So uh, they sent that coat that contained many colors, uh, and brought it to their dad. And then they said to him, we found this coat. Uh, no now, meaning, can you tell if it's your son's coat or not? If it's Joseph's coat or not? Notice a typology of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see that Christ's garments are also dipped in blood, if some of you didn't know about that. We're going to look at uh, these interesting passages about it. First of all, I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah 63. Notice that Christ's uh, coat is also dipped in blood. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 63 which covers his second advent at Armageddon. When he conquers his, en his enemies, his coat becomes dipped in blood. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? Verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. I want you to also turn to Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Now, what are the odds that the brothers would take the blood of a goat to... Uh, dip Joseph's garment in. Christ's garments, they're dipped in the blood of goats. How about that? What are the odds of that happening? Go to Isaiah chapter 34, and then we'll read verse 
6, verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. So this is Armageddon again. So it uh, matches up with Isaiah 63. That's the context. Uh, you'll notice that at verse 2 and verse 3. That's no doubt Armageddon, Jesus coming down. So by that context, if his coat is dipped in blood, which we already know from Isaiah 63, notice which blood. <coughs> verse 6 continues, It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath the sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. You'll notice Isaiah 63 mentioned that. Died. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? So there is no doubt it all matches up together. Let's also uh, go back to the main text. Go back to the main text. Verse 33, let's see Jacob's response at verse 33. And he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. <coughs> An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. So Jacob, he knows the coat to be Joseph's. And then he says, it's my son's coat. Some dreadful, horrible, evil animal ate him up, devoured Joseph. Joseph is, no doubt about it, just torn in pieces, rent in pieces. That's the meaning. Now, this verse speaks very strongly about you reap what you sow. If you recall Jacob's old sin, he deceived his daddy with goat skins as well. Now he sees his boys deceiving the daddy with goat's blood. You reap what you sow. That's why it's so important to get your life in order, get right with God. I always said this to kids. I always said this to kids and teens. Best time to live right for God is now. Yeah. You might say, why? Because your kid will repeat your mistake. And it's a scientific fact anyway. You don't have to be Christian. They take your genetics. <laughs> so they're going to take some of the behavior patterns from you. So that's why it's so important to make sure your life is in order right with God. Otherwise, your children will be the reaping of what you've sown. Now, another uh, picture right here, which is incredible. Go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. And then we'll look at verse 16. Psalm 22. And then we'll read verse 16. Another amazing picture to notice Jacob said that uh, his son has been devoured by an evil beast. You'll notice that Christ's crucifixion is described as being devoured by an evil beast. Look at Psalm 22. We'll read verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. See that? Wild beast. The, assembling, uh, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's Jesus Christ. So there's no doubt about it. Now look at verse 13. Verse 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths. See that? As a ravening and roaring lion. Notice this devouring. Notice this devouring. That's why uh, we can see so much similarities with Jesus Christ and Joseph. It's crazy. It's insane. There's no doubt the author of that book is not Moses. It is God Almighty himself. Let's also uh, go back to our main text again. Returning to our main text again. Notice right here it says in verse 33, Joseph is without doubt what? Rent in pieces. Notice at death there is a rent. At death there is a rent. Jesus Christ also at his death, there was a veil rent, torn from top to bottom right at his death. Look at the book of Matthew 27. Matthew 27. So many pictures. So many pictures of Jesus Christ. It's very interesting. Matthew chapter 27. We'll read verse 51. Notice that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, after he cried out, it is finished, the temple in Jerusalem 
had the veil of the Holy of Holies and it was torn from top to bo bottom. There's a rent. Matthew 27, 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The rocks even rent itself. Okay, so returning back to our main text again. Returning back to our main text again. Continuing on, verse 34. <coughs> and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. So Jacob, as I've told you before, when you're in deep grief and sorrow, you would tear your clothes. So Jacob tore his clothes, but then also around his loin, that area, he put sackcloth. So sackcloth, it's uh, very uncomfortable, but a lot of Jews have used that. Some people would describe it as a burlap sack, I think, or some other stuff. But the Jews would always wear these things during time of mourning. It's a time of discomfort. It's a time uh, of grief, which is why nothing is more annoying than putting sackcloth upon your loins. And he also grieved. He cried out, mourned for Joseph a long, long time, many days. Verse 35, and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. So all of his children, sons and daughters, they got up to try to comfort their father, but Jacob refused the comfort. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Uh, Jacob insisted by saying, I will go down to the grave. I will die weeping for the death of my son. I will die this way. And so that's how his father kept grieving for him. It's really sad. You talk about the brothers, if they had no conviction selling their brother, they definitely would feel this conviction seeing the grief of, and the hurt of their father. God will get your attention for you to get convicted one way or the other. Remember that. Well, that don't convict me. Well, you sure don't want the Lord to try other means to convict you. All right, verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. So the Midianites, uh, bleh, the Midianites, they sell Joseph to Egypt to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar, he's an officer of Pharaoh's, basically the captain of the guard. Thank you. All right, now we start 37. Excuse me, 38. <clears throat> Now, this is, believe it or not, there are some interesting parts in this chapter. And it's a side story. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. So that's self-explanatory. It just said that it just so happened through uh, the process of time later on that day, during those days, that Judah, he went away from his brethren and then he uh, found room and boarding. He stayed at a certain Adulamite's place. This Adulamite's name is Hira. The problem with this passage <clears throat> and the critics, they always go by sequence. That's why they're stupid to think that Genesis 1 and 2, there's a contradiction. That's an old criticism. Stop that, okay? You're not showing me your intelligence by doing that, especially if you boast your PhD. All right, don't, don't show me your idiocy more. It's getting old, just stop. I think any per person who has zero PhD who reads that Bible will learn by now nothing is in sequence. All right, there are things obviously that can be in sequence, don't get me wrong, but not everything is in sequence. Okay, you're a dummy if you think that way. Read the book of Revelation. You think that sequence? Some loser in Arizona thinks so, in yeah. half of it and the other half it is. You know, the, when you read that book, you got to realize that nothing's in sequence, all right? What I mean by that is, of course, there are some things in sequence, but what I meant was not everything is in sequence. You have to keep that in mind. So, <clears throat> the critics, old argument, all right? Same old, same old. If they point out a different verse in the King James Bible to point out an error how the timeline don't fit, automatically, you should assume, I wonder if it's in sequence. Right. You should question that. 
90% of the time, you could be right. So keep that in mind. Now, the problem is that Joseph, he was, remember, 17 years old, right? So if Joseph was 17 years old at Genesis 37.2 and then sold off into Egypt, and then later on we find out that he was in his 30s, he was in his 30s when, the, when he became governor of the land, and also his brothers already, uh, his brother Judah already went to Egypt. So this story at Genesis 38 should be before Judah went into Egypt. But the timeline is so small <clears throat> when you look at verse 3, 4, 5, <clears throat> and 6. 3, 4, 5, 6 shows his children born. And the first two boys, they do marry a woman named Tamar. That means they got to be very, very young. Or it doesn't fit the timeline at all. They're, they got to be extremely young, maybe kids. So that's the critic's argument. But the simple answer to debunk that Notice right here, the first part of verse 1, it says, and it came to pass at that time, right? Well, what time? The context of that time is chapter 37, right? If it's a context of that time, chapter 37, what is the timeline that chapter 37 is covering? Verse 2, remember? These are the what? Generations of Jacob. As I've told you before, chapter 37, verse 2, when it talks about these are the generations of Jacob, it's already introducing to you that this story may not be in sequence after chapter 36. It's just simply a whole summary of what happened in Joseph's life. So these are the generations of Jacob is giving a different perspective, a different story that's covering the timeline of what? all of Jacob's children. So that's the concentration. The concentration of the story is the timeline of Jacob's children. That could be any timeline. See that? That could be any timeline. So if the story is covering simply about, I'm going to tell you stories or the timeline about Jacob's children, then chapter 38 will be included in chapter 37 verse 2. And whatever that timeline is, these are the generations of Jacob, you could put it at any timeline, see? You could put it at any timeline. You don't have to put out a specific sequence or a specific timeline and then make the Bible contradict itself. All right, now uh, let's return to the passage. Now, uh, Judah, when he turns into this Adulamite, stays over uh, with Hira, the Adulamite, Verse 2, what happens? And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. So Judah just happened to see uh, Hira's daughter, and then, uh, uh, excuse me, they're, uh, they're a daughter of a certain Canaanite. So he sees uh, a Canaanite girl, right? And then he decides to sleep with her and marry her, and her name was Shua. Now, notice the, the de degradation of the family. One thing we learn from Genesis and from history is that men never learn from history. Children become worse than the parents. Younger generations will follow the example of their older generation and make it worse. We saw that in the generation chapter of Genesis 4 and 5, right? You might recall that. So Judah... He follows the example of his uncle. How about that? He follows the example of his uncle. Jacob didn't even do this. But why would Judah do it? See, kids are watching you. You don't have to be a parent. They're watching you. Uh, all it takes is just one bad word that they hear from some random stranger, not even from a parent, and that is locked inside the child's brain for life. People wouldn't do these atrocious, sinful things if they never heard about it before, if they never saw it before. Sometimes you wonder where they get that from. It's from something that they saw or heard, and all it takes is once. Let's see right here. So he married uh, with a Canaanite girl. Verse 3, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. So then Shua gives birth to a son, and then... 
his name is Ur. Now, here are the names of Judah's family tree. So, first of all, Hira, his name means nobility. So, he befriended somebody there in Canaan. And then his name is Noble. Shua is the girl that he just happens to meet. So, who knows? Maybe Judah, he decided to go off to college. You know, all right, mom, dad, I'm going to go away from the family, go to college, live my own life. Befriends a person named Hira, sleeps with a girl named Shua, and then later on, hey, let's get married. And sounds very much like today's human nature, right? right. Not, nothing different. Her, na uh, her name means wealth, or it also means cry for help. Quite a contradiction. So whatever the meaning you want to choose, and I guess that will be the meaning of her name. Who knows? The son's name is Ur. Now, Ur means watcher. His name means watcher. Second son's born, verse 4, and she conceived again and bare a son, and he called his name Onan. So she gives birth to another son. His name is Onan, which means strength. His name means strength. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah, and he was at Chizib when she bare him. So she gives birth, uh, she, uh, she conceives again, and gives birth to a son. And then his name is Sheila. No, it's not a daughter, all right? I know you're thinking a girl's name, but no, it's a boy's name, all right? Uh, Sheila. And by the way, it's funny. I thought that was funny. His name means prayer. I don't know. I, I think that's a coincidence. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> so the name is Sheila, means prayer. Now, he was at uh, Chizib when she gave birth to Sheila. So it was at a, probably a different location. That's why he mentions that, at Chizib. Verse 6, And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. So Judah uh, finds a wife for his firstborn son Ur, and then the woman's name is Tamar. Tamar means standing upright palm tree. So her, names mean, her name means palm tree. Verse 7, now this is pretty interesting here. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. So Ur is Judah's oldest son. Now, uh, he did something that we don't know, but apparently he was very, very wicked. And then what he did in God's sight made God kill him. Now, there are several clues we can find here. There are several clues we can find <clears throat> on what may have happened. If you look at this chapter, what is the main issue with this family? It's sex. You hit the nail on the head. It's sex. Okay, am I out of bounds? All right. It is sexual sins. That's what's going on with the family. Whatever, the father made that mistake, right? I mean, it's an innocent thing. Everyone does this at college when I'm away from the, my family. Yeah, then when you get kids, you wonder why they're doing something that you wouldn't ever do. And psychologists are so stupid nowadays, and scholars are so stupid nowadays. Why is our kid messing up? We don't understand, you know. We just got to give them more motivation. We got to give them more candy. We got to do more wonderful things. And no, by doing that, they all fall apart. Let me make the answer simple for you. Because you parents sin. There, problem solved. Get rid of sin. Then your children can uh, be set forth as a good example from the parents. Because psychologists, scholars refuse to repent of their sin, <clears throat> then they keep finding other solutions to solve the children's problem, and they wonder why the generation is such a messed up condition. Wicked. Right. Wicked people. Sin is always a problem, just remember that. All right? That's 90% that's of the time why the world is in the bad state that it's in. You'd be surprised. Sexual sin. So Judah is the one that messes up, and he does what is very normal for any person who lives in the Bay Area or in our generations today, right? right. So let me just put quote-unquote normal sin, okay? Normal sin. Then Ur, he just messes up. Why? Because maybe it's not, you know, everybody does this in college, but now I'm wondering if I should try, experiment something else. So maybe Ur does something and says, uh, hey, Dad, um, uh, I think that I identify as something else. Is that, the, is that the case? Maybe. Clue is this. One is that it's a sexual sin. 
Two, it, notice the wording here. It says, <clears throat> Ur was what? Wicked in the sight of the Lord. Go to Genesis 13. Yep. He was wicked in God's sight, in the sight of the Lord. Now, if you, want, if you think about this, what did uh, God say in the same book by context? If we want to go by uh, the best interpretation, Scripture with Scripture, and even more so if it's by context, right? If it's by context, it's even more so. Notice verse 13. The Bible says, but the men of Sodom were, notice what? Wicked and sinners before the Lord. See? At his presence exceedingly. By the way, verse 13 don't tell you what their sin was. But we, knew, but we know what it was. Why? Because we found it out in Jude and other verses. Same thing right here. Why wouldn't the author mention specifically the sin? See that? It's, uh, you can tell by the author's tone right here, the style of writing and everything. It must be the same sin. That's how I see it as. But uh, let's add scripture with scripture. Let's add the pieces and the clues. First of all, I want you, uh, the next part is Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Notice verse 20, Genesis chapter 18, and then verse 20. Notice what God described about Sodom. He says right here, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is very great, because their sin is very grievous. I will go, na I will go down now and what? See whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. Something that they did that God saw that sorely displeased him. And we know what that sin was concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. Another one that uh, we can compare, let's see right here, verse 13, uh, chapter 19, verse 13, chapter 19, verse 13. Notice the language of every time it has to do with the Sodomite sin, it has to do with something wicked before God's presence, what he sees. It's all tied to that. Uh, Genesis 19, 13. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the what? Face of the Lord. All right. Well, you're stretching things. No, not when you look at history. Look at our generations. This is what we, th this is what we do. Yeah. And then you wonder why your kid or your grandkid is. When you have a family reunion to get, get, to get together. Oh, you identify. What? That didn't happen to me when I was, yeah, what, because you were doing this. That was normal. Yeah. yeah, amen. Okay, here's another interesting passage. Go to Job 36. Job 36. Now, Ur, he died very young, right? right. He died very young. Notice what the Bible says about dying young. Job chapter 36, verse 14. It describes dying in youth as something as very wicked or, another word, unclean. Right. Unclean. Look at Job 36, verse 14. They die in youth. Er, right? And their life is among the what? Unclean. You know what's very interesting? Dr. Uckman pointed this out. If you compare scripture with scripture with unclean, a lot of times it can connect to yep. this lifestyle. Yep. And, and, believe it or not, if Greek and Hebrew scholars want to do Hebrew, you look at that Hebrew word unclean, it's sodomite. How about that? Very strange stuff. I think that's what happened. When I look at all of these uh, points, and they turn into evidence. All right, go to Job 38 again. <clears throat> go to Job 38 again. And then we'll look at verse 8. Job chapter 38, and then we'll read verse 8. Now, notice that the reason why the Lord keeps slaying these people is because of some kind of sexual sin that just keeps popping out. Verse 8, <clears throat> And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. So Judah, he says to Onan, look, Ur died. 
uh, you got to go in your brother's place. You've got to produ uh, produce seed generation for your brother. So marry Tamar, which is your brother's wife, and then raise up seed for your brother. Now, that's an Old Testament thing, which is pretty normal, is that if the older brother dies, the younger brother's job that time during the old days is to marry that uh, older brother's wife and then continue his lineage. That's the reason why, notice right here, now you wouldn't believe this, okay? This chapter is really good to describe today's culture and their treatment of sex. Uh, when we look at Job chapter 38 and then verse uh, 9, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. Okay, meaning that verse 9, Onan knew that the seed that he'll produce, children, okay, is not his. He knows that it should not be his. It should be his brother's, right? So in his mind, you might wonder the last part of verse 9, in his mind, it would make sense why he doesn't want to produce that seed uh, with his brother's wife. Why? Because it's not his. It should not be his. It should be his brother's that he's carrying on. So notice right here, there's that selfishness. No, I ain't doing that for my brother. So uh, I ain't going to do that with my brother's wife. So then, that's why the next part of verse 9, it says, and it came to pass, meaning what so happened is that when he, uh, slept, uh, when he uh, slept with his brother's wife, when he went in unto his brother's wife, when he had intercourse so that he can uh, produce seed to produce children, that he spilled it on the ground lest that he should give seed unto his brother. So then instead of uh, putting the seed where the wife can be able to conceive and give birth to children, he instead just spilled it on the ground. Why? That's birth control. And then God, what? Oh, it's normal, so I get it, you know. No, verse 10, and the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Now, you notice that God's norms is not your norm here in this Bay Area. Okay, if, in case, let me uh, explain the, every word. Verse 10, the thing that Onan did, birth control, uh, it displeased God. So God killed him. Now, let me tell you God's norm. If this is all shock to you, then I think uh, I need to explain to you the reason <laughs> why God would do that. Because, now this might be foreign to you, all right? But this should be basic. But even grown adults don't know this. Oh, I don't get it. Why? Well, a little baby you, all right, little child you, let me explain to you the basics, okay? It's normal in God's mind, this was basics, that if you are to uh, become one flesh with somebody, that's considered automatically marriage to God's eyes. And when he sees that as marriage, he also sees that you both will produce children together. He does not want something where, no, I don't want to have children with my wife right here. I'm going to use this for my own thing. And then what? What do people do? And they, uh, that's why they sleep with multiple people. They treat uh, conception, they treat uh, sex as something as nonchalant that you can play around with. No, God treats this as something serious. All in one partner. He doesn't want it playing around and then you just mess around and then you get a messed up society because of that. It's so wicked. So that's why, you know why there are abortions? You thought about that? I know why. Don't give me this health reason. That can be an excuse, I get that, but I know that's not the primary reason why it came out. It's because everybody was sleeping with everybody. It's so obvious because of the consequences, exactly. Because of the consequences. That's why it first came out, if you're going to be very honest about it. I know all the excuses, and they can be good excuses, but if we're going to overlook all the excuses, go to the heart of the matter... Why did it first come out and you study that time period, the people's sexual behavior that time? It's so obvious. All right. <clears throat> Anyways, if we were to uh, look at these passages to prove this, go to Matthew 22. Let's start off with Matthew 22. Notice that it was considered the norm that 
uh, during those days, so not today's culture, but in the old culture, if an older brother died and he cannot continue the lineage for his wife, his younger brother is supposed to continue that lineage. So Matthew chapter 22, notice right here in verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, in verse 24, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. See, he's supposed to raise up, continue the seed, not control the seed. Do whatever I want to do with the seed. Okay, go to Matthew 19, Matthew 19. But it's something that we play around, right? It's something that we play around with. It's something serious. Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says in verse 5. Notice what is considered marriage. It's automatically considered marriage when flesh joins flesh. And it becomes one flesh. Matthew 19, 5, And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. See, once they become husband and wife, it's automatically what? At the same time, when they join flesh. Marriage is flesh joining flesh. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no, no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. But man always puts that asunder. Doing whatever they want. They control, they control. All right, let's go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Now, obviously, I'm, when I, uh, birth control, it can have such a loose definition and term. I get that. So I'm not saying that if there's a couple who are married, but they're not interested to have kids yet, that they're sinning against God when they just don't, hey, make a baby immediately. Obviously not. But the birth control that I'm condemning is where it's outside of marriage, see that? Where it's you, you play and mess around with the sea. And then you manipulate and do whatever you want with that. You're getting scientists dabbling with that. That's something that sorely displeases God. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Notice in verse 27. Genesis 127. Notice Adam and Eve as their husband and wife. What did God say to them? Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Through that uh, marriage together, when they become one flesh, God knows it's the norm at verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now that's a command. Notice that. You see that? That's a command by God right there that when flesh joins as one flesh, it's going to be the norm that you have children together. All right? That's a command. Outside of that command where you're trying to be fruitful or mess around with the seed, birth control, stuff like that somewhere else, you're not right with God. So understand that. Understand you are not right with God. So that's important. So again, like I'm telling you, if you're, uh, I'm not saying that birth control, meaning that if, uh, like Abraham and Sarai, they didn't have children, so if uh, there's a couple that don't have kids, that, hey, uh, you're sinning against God, you got to start, <laughs> have babies immediately, that's not what I'm saying again. What, the birth control that I'm condemning is that this is outside of marriage, outside the norm where God expects that, hey, if flesh joins flesh, it's normal that you're married. It's normal that you produce seed together. If you do something outside of that, that's abnormal. Right. Abnormal. This is not normal. Understand that. All right? Get that out of your stinking cultural mindset. Yeah. That's not the norm. Get that out of there. You've got an abnormal head, and you'll wonder why you get abnormal children after that. Okay, go to Genesis 38. Genesis 38. The Bible speaks so well about human nature. Us very well. Okay, Genesis chapter 38. We'll read verse uh, 8. Genesis chapter 38. And then uh, we'll read verse 8. And Judah said unto Onan... Uh, oh, I already read that part. Verse 10, uh, verse 11, excuse me. Verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar his daughter-in-law... Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. 
Okay, again, I'm going to explain every word in the verse. That way people can understand. So Judah says to Tamar, who's his daughter-in-law that married his sons, stay a widow, okay, at your father's house until my third son, Sheila, is grown because he's not grown enough yet to marry her. For he said, lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. So he's saying, un, uh, otherwise, uh, possibly, he could die as his brothers. So just wait till he's grown up. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So Tamar, uh, she uh, went and she got up and lived with her father's house after that. The wording is pretty interesting right here. The wording right here seems to uh, show that at verse 11, if Judah is scared about his third son dying, marrying Tamar, what would be the reason? He says when Sheila is grown up, then you can marry, right? So meaning that until Sheila is, at the, is a grown-up age, I think then he won't die, right? Meaning then, Ur and Onan, they could have been very, very young. They could have been very, very young. There are some rabbis who uh, see from this story that they could have been very young. But remember, that's the norm. That's the norm of this culture. So why would you be in shock? All right. I don't know why people are in shock hearing this from me. I mean, that's the norm. You see that every day around you. So, Okay, anyway, uh, Genesis 38. Let's go to over here at verse... Um, 12, and in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. Now, it just, verse 12 shows that it just so happened later on, that's what in process of time means, uh, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. So remember that uh, Shua... Let's see right here. Uh, Shua, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shuda, uh, Shua, Judah's wife, died. So why did, the, uh, why did she die? I wonder if the Lord did another thing, right? Because his marriage wasn't right with the Lord. So Judah was comforted, went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath. He and, so Judah received comfort, and then after his wife died, and then he decided to spend his off time with uh, the sh uh, people who were shearing sheep in Timnath. So I'm going to go with my buddy again, Hira the Adulamite. Let's go out again. Uh, typical of today's culture. Uh, that's what people do. People do that. Um, let's see right here. We see verse 12. It's in Timnath, right? Now, if this is in Timnath, notice in verse 13, and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put her widow's garments off from her. Now, notice right here that somebody told Tamar that, hey, your father-in-law, uh, lo and behold, he's going up to Timnath to shear sheep. So Timnath is close to where Tamar is located. Do you recall uh, a certain person in the Bible who saw a woman that was pleasing to his eyes in Timnath? That he wanted to marry. Judges 14. Judges 14. Samson. Samson. So Tamar then we can see that she is part of the Canaanites or the Canaanites family line. The Canaanites uh, fellow uh, kins or their genealogies. Judges 14. So Tamar then what we do know about Tamar is that she is likely to be a Canaanite. As a matter of fact, there are even rabbis who believe that too. That she could have been a Canaanite or close to one of the Canaanite people where they all come from Ham. So it's either or. Then notice right here the marriage again wasn't right. You see that? The marriage again wasn't right because the Jews were supposed to marry Jews they were not supposed to marry the Canaanites. So it just so happened again. Judges 14. Uh, notice right here that what Samson saw, verse 1, 
And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. How about that? Okay, go back. Go back. All right, this will be interesting later on if we can reach the end verses, okay? If she's a Canaanite, this is going to be very interesting later, all right? I'll show you later on. <clears throat> if we look at verse uh, 14, so what did, uh, what did Tamar do? She, and she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. Okay, meaning, what does each and every word mean? So she puts away her widow's garments off from her. Because remember, Judah told her, stay as a widow, right? So she was dressed as a widow. But there's something, she's like sick and tired of it. So she covers herself with a veil. She wraps herself. And then she sits out in an open place that's on the way to Timnath. Why? Why would she do that? Because Sheila was grown up, but then he was not yet given to Tamar yet for wife, as a wife. So she wants to get back at Judah some way. Now this is a way to get back, which is messed up. Verse 15, it's a mess. Genesis 38, as you notice, is, uh, greatly pictures today's modern society. Okay? Let's see right here. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. So when Judah sees Tamar, who's wearing that veil, and she, she wrapped herself with these garments, the attire was a harlot. So Judah thought her to be that way. So that because she covered her face. Now, some of the scribes, they'll mention in verse 14, or modern Bibles, when you read it, in verse 14, where she sat in an open place, they'll say, she sat at the entrance of the gate, or something like that. Because in an open place doesn't seem to make sense. No, uh, you, they, don't, they didn't read Proverbs 9, all right? Proverbs 9. These women do have a tendency to do this in the Bible. Go to Proverbs 9. Why? To catch the, per, the target that they want, their attention. That's just common sense. Go to Proverbs chapter 9. They don't read their Bibles. Proverbs chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says at verse 13. Proverbs 9, 13. Solomon warned his son about this, that these women have a tendency to do that, to make sure that they are in an open place where people catch attention. Verse 13. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. See? Out in the open. To call passengers who go right on their ways. See? Right out in the open. Remember, Tamar was in an open place on the way to Timnath. That's what the verse said. She knows what she was doing. Verse 16, whoso is simple. Yeah, Judah is simple. Let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth under understanding, Judah doesn't want understanding, she saith to him, stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Okay, go back. Go back to Genesis 38. Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. We'll read verse 16. Verse 16. And he turned unto her by the way. Oh, fulfilling Proverbs 9. Whoever is simple, let him turn into her. Right? So, so Judah, uh, when he's passing by her way, he just turns into her and says to her, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. So Judah, he says to Tamar, look, I request you, uh, uh, let me have intercourse with you. Let me stay with you for the night. But he didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law because she covered herself. And she said, what wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? So then she says, what are you going to give to me? That way we can 
uh, spend the night together. So verse 17, and he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. Now, uh, Judah says, the price that I'll give to you is a, a baby goat from the flock. Now, in the Old Testament, that's expensive then. So this is an expensive prostitute right here. This is an expensive prostitute. <clears throat> Verse 17, and she said, wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? So she asked uh, Judah, hey, I need a pledge. So basically, I need some kind of down payment. I need some kind of commitment. I need something as proof that, uh, hey, that... Un uh, until I receive this pledge, then I'm going to uh, hold on to it until you send me my payment, which is the baby goat. And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. So Judah says, what's the pledge that I'll give to you? Uh, what's this uh, small thing that I can give to you that will show my commitment that, hey, uh, we sealed the deal together until I give you the baby goat. So she says, I want uh, your signet ring, and then your bracelets, and then the staff that's in your hand. And he gave it her, and he came and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So uh, Judah gave uh, the stuff to her, uh, went in with her, and then she became pregnant. Now Judah should know better his sin, his sin. What he did also was, he went so far that with this normal sin that he's done, right? Because you can sleep with pretty much anybody now. But now he's committing the sin of prostitution. But then this is worse. This prostitution is tied to idolatry. The prostitution that's tied to all idolatry is because of the pledge. And also it was common during the Old Testament times that what they had were temple prostitutes. So knowing full well what he was doing was supporting actually idolatry. In the land of Canaan, they had these false gods that they worshipped, and they all connected that to sex. And then uh, the, uh, the prostitutes was common with that one. Look at Amos 2. Amos 2. This was pretty common. Go to the book of Amos, and then we'll go to chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. Notice that God condemned the Jews because they were connecting religious worship uh, with fornication, with the women. Look at Amos 2 verse 7. Amos 2 7. That pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. Okay, we see right here that this is uh, definitely not a normal thing. This has got to be a prostitute. And they lay themselves down upon clothes, laid to what? Pledge by every altar. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Judah should know way better when he went to the land of Canaan. But no, it's normal to do that nowadays. And then when you marry someone with a different religion, that's just common and we tolerate everybody's beliefs. That's normal, isn't it? I mean, that's normal. Go to Genesis 38. What a wicked society we live in. There is no doubt about it. Right. We became depraved. We became a zoo, people. This is not uh, civilized society. <laughs> You're way off your rocker. This is a zoo we're living in. This is a zoo we're living in. Go to Genesis chapter 38 and then verse 19. Verse 19. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. Meaning that she got up, she went on her way, then she uh, laid aside that uh, prostitute veil away from her and retreated back put on again her widowhood garments, pretending that she's been a widow all that time. Verse uh, 20, And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adu Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Okay, meaning that Judah, he sent the baby goat 
uh, through uh, his friend, the Adulamite, higher up. And that way uh, he can uh, receive his pledge, you know, the staff, the signet, the bracelets. He can get that back from uh, Tamar. But lo and behold, they can't find her. She's not there. So he's worried. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where's the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So he was worried. He was asking the men of that region, Hey, where, where's the prostitute that was, right, uh, that was in the open area by the wayside? And they said, There was no prostitute here. Verse 22, And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said there was, that there was no harlot in this place. So uh, Hira, his friend, uh, returned to Judah, and then he said, hey, I can't find her. Also, the men of that area said that there was no prostitute here in that place. And then verse 23, and Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. So Judah is worried, sick, because he said, uh, let her take that baby goat for herself, otherwise we're going to be ashamed. We're going to be shamed in front of this entire community because... Uh, hey, I gave this baby goat and you didn't find her. Now, imagine the shame when you don't keep the promise. If you don't keep the promise, there's a lot of shame. Why? It could be accusations here, right? Like we've been hearing on the news all the time about the indictment, the indictment, stuff like that. Because some person of big reputation could be shamed because we made a deal. So then maybe there could be false accusations coming out. Or it could be that because he's a Christian, he should know better, right? And he gave away that signet ring. So basically, he gave away his testimony and everyone's going to know. And once daddy finds out and the whole city knows about it, be sure your sin will find you out. No, it ain't normal. You can't just go away, do your own thing. You're free from mommy and daddy. Go to your friends and live out your independent lifestyle and live nonchalantly the way that you want especially when it comes down to sex. You will shame yourself one day, and you're going to have messed up kids one day too, if you're not careful. Okay, uh, when we read this passage in verse 24, we will continue that at our next Genesis study, all right? So verse 24, we'll continue that in our next Genesis study. But uh, so far what we've seen is some interesting notions is that uh, the children may have been younger, that's one thing we noticed right here. Concerning the incidents with uh, Judah and Tamar, what he told her, the children may have been, uh, they may have been children, excuse me. They, uh, Ur, Onan uh, may not have been men, but they could have been children. Children uh, or like uh, older teens maybe, that's the more accurate uh, wording. So let me write that, okay? So it could have been uh, older teens, so very young, all right? So that could have been the case, and then there's something there that the Lord, uh, Lord may not have been pleased. But who knows, right? Who knows? It just seems to be that way from the clue. The second thing that we noticed right here is that Judah was getting involved with idolatry. Judah involved himself with idolatry when he was doing fornication. One day, folks, uh, keep an eye out. Uh, you might be committing the sin of idolatry. You just don't know it because of the toleration of other gods, other people's beliefs. When, uh, when flesh joins flesh, all right, it's impossible to not be influenced by the other. You have to tolerate some things that they do, and then you'll compromise your Christian standing. So Judah got involved in idolatry because of what we saw with the pledge right here which is a very interesting notion when we compare that with Amos chapter 2. We also saw that the scholars were wrong because it was uh, pretty common that time that the open place uh, is a tendency that those women do when you compare that with Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Okay, let's close it off here and then we'll... I got to... There are some interesting things here concerning about Tamar that we'll cover next time. Father God, I pray that today's verse-by-verse uh, -verse Bible study has been a blessing to the hearers. Help us to grow more in the scriptures. Uh, bless the break time. Bless the fellowship. And the next service that we're going to have, in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen.